The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Everyone, I want to thank you so much for Thank you so much for coming. I'm going to be talking about Gyro today, which is an open source project that Spy Technology is, is sponsoring and getting started with. Um, we're, just, <coughs> we're just launching this project, and one of the things that we wanted here at this conference was to find like-minded individuals. Um, we've already just been just really humbled by the amount of interest and people stopping by the booth and stuff like that. And I see some faces here that look familiar from conversations we've had at the booth. And I appreciate you taking your time here to hear kind of our vision and where we plan on going with this thing. Kind of what the concept is a bit. And I want to make sure we have an opportunity for people to ask, ask questions. I'm a networking guy, and I have been for a long time. I, I uh, actually went to technical college back in back in 80, 81 time frame at Mid Midlands Technical in Columbia. But over time I became a teacher and then came back into computing. Um, in 2010, November of 2010, I got laid off and, and started this company. Um, we're based in Simpsonville, South Carolina. We sell specialized wireless routers, especially right now, VPN, so VPN client routers with the ability for you to create um, individualized gateways for the devices on your, on your network. Um, we start off as DDWRT folks, um, but supporting DDWRT in the field was really difficult because, boy, you'd hit the reset button and all the configs and everything you've done, the scripts, everything that you've got underlying is gone. And so in spring 2011, we hired our first programmer. In fall 2011, we released our first firmware. And um, we're currently on version five. We've got 10 employees here, and we ship worldwide every day. Um, and Lolo, actually, if you could bring one of the accelerator units and like that hall unit, because I wanted to be able to show that off. So I've got a networking background. Back in the old, old days, I, I remember installing a Altos unit in Malden for an uh, electronic or electric supply company. It was one multi-user MPM system, and we ran serial cable all over the building and. Uh, to connect the monitors, and it, it's craziness when I think back on it. Um, and my most recent kind of big networking gig was I worked in Chicago for a couple of for a couple of years selling Cisco networks for you know multinational companies and stuff like that. Um, but for four years, from 2004 to 2008, I was in Thailand. And it was so painful and so difficult to get high-speed internet into my neighborhood that once I had done it and crossed that big hump, I started using DDWRT to create a, a neighborhood network so that all the mission families and stuff, I was there with Youth with a Mission, to make sure that we could share that one, that one broadband internet. So I got started out with DDWRT, and what happened was when I came back from Thailand in 2008, got a job right out of the gate as CIO of a company in, in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. But when I got laid off, one of the first things that came to mind was that DDWRT, the things I'd done with that, and I realized there's a lot of people, thank you, there's a lot of people who want the results, but don't necessarily want to be a router hobbyist. And that, I started looking for how do I bridge that gap. So our software development was on MIPS. So the typical router platform that you're familiar with is running a MIPS chip somewhere between 700 
megahertz to 600 megahertz. They have 32 megs of RAM up to about 128. They've, and they've got eight megs of flash. Some of them have four megs of flash for the hard drive and that goes up to about 64 megs or something like that. Last year we did our first x86 project which was a VPN accelerator which we built on a uh, Foxconn unit that was dual core Atom 1.8 gigahertz uh, 2 gigs of RAM is what we put in it with a 4 gig flash and then now what we're looking is the gyro project. So I want to make sure I make it clear here. Sabai Technology is a company and yes we need to make money and all that kind of stuff but we want to sponsor the world's best router platform and we hope to make our money selling and supporting it on hardware and, and, uh, and basically being the solution for people who don't want to be hobbyists. But we also want to partner with the people who are hobbyists or are developers and, and love working at the networking level. So here's part of the thing that I saw. One of the early things when I, you know, when I was in Thailand working on the DDWRT, I really didn't think about it very much. But when I got laid off and I started taking a look at routers and, and what the routing need was out there that wasn't being met, because lots of people were flashing with DDWRT and the, and the question was why? You know, why are they doing this? Why are they spending this time? There's something they're trying to accomplish that they couldn't do with their Linksys firmware. So I remember, you know, that first day when I'm, when I'm cracking open the box to, to try to de-brick my first router that I bricked and all of a sudden I'm, I'm realizing this thing's just a little computer. It's got a CPU, it's got a hard drive, it's just a little piece of flash memory, it's got RAM. It just doesn't have the video and the keyboard. But other than that, it's just a little computer and I don't know why I didn't get that before. You know, we all have Ro Roku's and smart TV's and we don't think of them as computers maybe, but that for me was a big revelation. Now, here's the opportunity that as I see it as a founder of a routing company. In 2002, consumer networking was 125 megahertz CPU, 16 megs of RAM, a 4 meg, four meg uh, flash. Today, all those years later, we're looking at a 600 megahertz CPU, 128 megs of RAM, and 128 megs of flash. There's been improvement, but daggone, it's just been incremental. And the user experience isn't that different. Just now in the past year, they kind of started doing some app type things and stuff like that. But to me, that's just linear progression. It's not exponential. Now on the computer side, if you take a look at 2002, we had some big clunky laptops, we had desktops. Here was kind of a typical configuration, 2.66 gigahertz with you know, single core with a 128 meg of RAM and a 30 gig hard drive. Well today, not only are the laptops slicker and the desktops cooler and run in amazingly faster, but we also have computing technology in our pocket in a smartphone. We also have it on our tablets. You know, the tablets today have far more power than the routers running the networks. And something's backwards here, guys. We're missing an opportunity. So I've already talked about some of these, but you can kind of get the idea of, you know, the MIP, MIPS router specs. They're running a Linux, um, is what we're running on them. It's a you know, single core processor. It might have a USB port. There's no video out. There may be a serial interface. Get out your soldering iron, okay? Because if you want access to it, you're going to have to pull the board and start soldering on so that you can connect to the serial interface. Here's the, you know, here's the compare and contrast. When we started developing for these, and, and one of the places where there was a lot of need was VPN. 
So we started creating a very simplified uh, VPN loading system and gateway system. But what we found was we were heading past the capability of the router. The router, you know, if you had a 50 meg connection, maybe we'd get 12 megs of throughput. If you had a lot of latency, maybe we're going to get four megs of throughput. Okay. And I remember one time I'm looking at our software and I'm like, ah, you know, yeah, I could be doing DLNA. And I've got a bunch of files at home I want to share. I've got like 80,000 songs on a hard drive and 20,000 photos and that kind of stuff. So I turn on DLNA, I hook up the hard drive, and my network goes. And the network just grinds to a halt because I had just given that little CPU <laughs> far more than it could possibly handle. And what's happening is it's kind of like you have to drive a golf cart, like that's your ride. And you may pimp that ride as much as you want, but it's still a golf cart. And if you want to head from here to Atlanta, it's going to be a rough trip. It's going to take a long time, and it's not going to be a whole lot of fun. Now, we've got this MIPS platform. We've got VPN set up on. It's, it's cranking away. It is at 98 99%. It's maxed out. You take the same processes, put it on a far more robust version of Linux, and now you're running at 3%. 4%. Maybe if you're cranking a bunch of data through the tunnel, you might get up to 20% utilization. To me, you know what? If I've got that much runway, I can do some cool stuff with that much capability that right now is just lying there dormant. It's a little bit in terms of analogy. You know, five years ago, a lot of people in this room probably had a clamshell phone. And it had firmware on it, just like your router has today. And you opened up that phone and it had two applications, or maybe three applications, and it had phone and contacts. It might have had some primitive browser. But you couldn't just dynamically, in, in a fluid way, add applications and things like that. That's exactly the transformation we're looking at doing in the router market. So what we're recommending for a gyro router, if you're putting together a system at home, and what we plan to be selling as a gyro router, we'll have specs more like this. We want enough room to have some capabilities and to be able to add modules and that kind of stuff. And we're going with an SSD drive, four gigs of RAM, USB 3.0, the next, the one of the units that's in development right now has the, the USB 3.0, processor speed, dual core 1.8, Atom. But you could certainly build a machine with i7 if you wanted that to be at the core of your network. Ubuntu server we're using the long term supported edition of 1204. Um, and then it'll have a gyro layer. I'll get more into the layers in just a minute. The, our current unit has VGA. The one next year will have HDMI. And there's a serial interface on the case. So if you're a developer, if you're a hobbyist, you have access now through serial. You have access through video and keyboard. You can, you know, you got full, full rights to this machine. So one day, <laughs> We plan on having one custom built for us that would look something like this. But these would be for antennas. You got your WAM port, HDMI, some dual USB, and ideally we would have five, six, eight ports. I want to have more ports than we currently have because if you're anything like me, four ports goes away real quick around your network.
So again, this just kind of reiterates. And then the wireless card in here will be a wireless N, eventually it can be AC, but it needs to be in master mode or have the capability of going in master mode so that you can run an access point on this device. Now here's where it gets cool though, is that if that, sure, if that gyro router is only running at 3%, 5%, 10%, you've got all this extra ca capability, what do you do with it? Well, there's a lot of projects that if you're like me, you spend a week putting together a machine that's going to be your file server, you spend a few days putting together a phone server at work, or you spend a few days. What I want to do really is standardize that process. There's no reason why you need to spend a week figuring something out, and I need to spend a week figuring something out, and Sebastian needs to spend a week figuring something out. It just seems like we should be able to figure it out once, create a plug-in module, and make that module available for the community for a one-click install. So these are some of the modules that we're considering will be kind of low-hanging fruit that just make a lot of sense on the network. And let me show you. So here's kind of a conceptual mock-up. This is not a working, this is just HTML files on my computer here. But you see that some of the modules are locked. And because just like your smartphone, when you get your smartphone, it comes with phone, browser, contact. There's a couple of things. If you've ever tried to erase any of those, it's not going to let you because you're going to break the device. Okay? So there's some base modules that just make sense that are going to be on the router. Then you've got modules that can add on, and we use some kind of brand names like XBMC or FreeNAS or FreePBX, just so you kind of get the idea. But when you scroll over one, it gives you a description of that module, what you're going into. And under networking, you would basically have every functionality that your standard router today has. That would be one of the modules. But then if you're into VPN, you may have this VPN module that lets you set up PPTP, L2TP, SSTP, SSTP OpenVPN. And VPN is a lot of what we cut our teeth on, so you can expect to see a lot of VPN type capabilities built into this device, probably out of the gate. Because we also have a customer base that wants faster and faster VPN routers. Under the mod store, we're looking at doing something that as modules get developed, we're able to test them in-house, make sure they meet the standards and that kind of stuff. Um, we're able to have users rate them, and you're able to one-click load a module onto this device. So the idea is just like you have a, a smart TV at home that may be running Linux in the background, the average user doesn't know that. All they know is they can add a functionality by clicking an app. That's what we want to bring to the router platform. To me, PBX is one of those things that should be a core functionality. One of the early modules, not that it's going to be on every one, but should be one of those things that you can test. The ability to do file serving, to do media streaming. The ability to stream to your TV through the HDMI port on the back if you wanted to. Or the ability to pull streaming IPTV from the device. Um, IP cameras, zone family filters. One of the things that I'll mention a little bit more about this is from a philosophical standpoint, an ethics standpoint, I'm of the general belief that I should have control over what comes into my house. I also believe that I should, have, I should have control of who knows personal things about me that I do within my house. So one of the things that we're going to be focusing on is that kind of security for this device.
Now, I want you to notice up here, the survive protected. I'll talk about that in just a minute when we get to modes, but it's a really important part of this project. So I've talked about many of these already. I'm not going to read the slide to you, but you get the idea. And here's what's great. I was talking with someone the other day, and I was like, well, what mod would you want to see on your gyro? And he said, an email server. Well, why, would you, why would you want an email server on your, on your home network when there's so many places that provide that service for free? He's like, because I want control. I don't want my files and my email repository sitting out there somewhere. I want it in my network, in my home. And I said, you know, that makes total sense. And what's great is, as we get this out in the community, there's going to be people with all sorts of great ideas. I don't need to own them all. I don't need to be the one coming up with all the ideas. It's about you guys coming up with the ideas. There's already, you know, a guy today who's like, well, does it run Radius Server? I'm like, well, why do you want this to run Radius Server? And he said, because I have a lot of my small businesses, multiple Synologies, and I want a Radius Server centralized that I'm like, create a module. So there's, you know, I'm going, I expect we're going to see lots of modules that we wouldn't have even expected. Now, I mentioned a minute ago about that Sabai protected mode. That's the router when you get it out of the box, if you buy one from us, if you're not installing one on your own hardware, if you're buying one from Sabai Technology, you turn it on, or if you've just installed Gyro on a device and you go to the web interface, it's in protected mode. That's the mode that you see your smart TV in. You're not seeing any of the back end stuff or anything. You're just seeing a running Linux system. In protected mode, you have the ability to reset the default. The mods that you would install have been vetted and Sabai Technology has gone through them and tested them, make sure there's no big conflicts with other software or made sure that those conflicts were resolved before they got out in the store. It's a one-click install. It's a one-click uninstall. And it's supported by us. So if you're running your router and you've installed a mod and something all of a sudden starts acting weird, you've got a place to go, a place to call where you actually talk to a person. In the mod control mode, which you probably ought to just call control mode, that's like one of you has, has developed a module and you email me and say, hey, I got this working. It seems to work great. Would you, would you try it out? Well, if I go in my control mode, I've accepted that I'm no longer under the umbrella of support for Sabai technology, but I can install anyone else's it's kind of like on your Android when you say, yes, I want to be able to install applications other than from the Google Play Store. And that's supported by your friends, the community. In developer mode, you can hook up, you can hook up monitor and keyboard, you can sudo in, you can SSH, you can get right down to the core and work command line. You can, even though the router is setting IP tables, you could go in and flush the IP table cache and put something else in. You can override anything. It's your machine. So basically, the idea is, is why should you ask permission to root it? It's your device. And what we're building into it, as much as we possibly can, is the ability for you to say, uh, all right, I think I screwed something up. Let me go back to protected mode. It works to undo what you've done or initiates a process for you to reflash the drive. But the idea is, is you should be able to play and as much as possible, we should make that sandbox a fun place to be. Worst case scenario, I can envision a developer sending in the hard drive, 
letting us flash it or us hooking them up to a, um, an image that they can just put in or download a flash drive to reflash the image kind of stuff. So here's conceptually the service layers, your system layers, and this is what we're developing. The whole thing is built on as standard a platform we feel that we can put it on and as user friendly a platform as we can do it on. And that's an Ubuntu Linux server running 64 bit uh, with a LAMP stack running. So that's what's at the core of this machine. It's not a micro Linux with BusyBox or something, it's a full blown. Ubuntu server that's very easy to get apps for and that kind of stuff. Now on top of that you've got the, the gyro package which is basically handling translation between the GUI and the underlying OS. So it's passing back and forth data, it's making sure you're not about to mess up your system, things like that. Then the user interface layer that's what you're seeing and you know working working on on the device and then you've got the modules that lay on top of that. So that's kind of the schema of how it works. Now on that first server layer, I already mentioned what it's got. Very standard, we're planning to use the long term support so as a new long-term support comes up, we would eventually migrate over to that and then continue that. Uh, very useful, easy to work with. Lots of apps, lots of applications. On the package layer, it's built on a LAMP, LAMP stack and PHP. Some of the stuff, I'm not the developer. I'm, <laughs> I'm the guy who conceptually like gets where we need to go and, and David who may be in here a little later who will be at the table when we're done uh, is actually helping put this all in code. Um, on the service configuration you have access to system functions through the API and it ensures there's no conflicts with the other configs and then you have configuration tracking so even on that device you're able to do rollbacks and things like that. On the GUI layer, one of the things is when you mouse over something, every object basically will have real-time help that's going with it. What, what, is the, you know, what is the gateway? What does that mean? What would the typical thing be? Why would you use the ACP versus static, et cetera? So real-time help that the, that the user, because remember, I want, I want someone who doesn't even understand that Linux is working on this to be able to run it if they want. In fact, I want that to be the mass market for it. Validation, at that GUI layer there's a validation that you're not putting in for the subnet mask 596, you know, that kind of stuff. It validates, it validates the data you're putting in. Very intuitive controls. Our tagline for our company is technology for the people and the idea is, is it's great that you and I can do these projects as, as weekend, weekend things that we're putting together, but what I think is even greater is when grandma can have a file server sitting in her home. And she doesn't know anything about that. All she knows is she's got all her photos in one place and she can find them. It's seamless, it makes sense. Now what you know is what the database is behind that. You know, you know all sorts of stuff that grandma's never going to know about that. But ideally, we want to bring this to the every man or every woman. Modular, ease of use, and in my control mode, you can literally load a file and install. Templating panels, if you're developing for this, you don't have to recreate the wheel every time. If we've got the slider bars figured out, we've got the validation figured out, all that kind of stuff, you can, um, as you're developing, tap into those templates. 
and then everything's as open as we can possibly make it. I gotta tell you, when I started this company, I don't think I put this in the slides, but I literally, I was just recovering from being in Thailand for four years. I had been taking every extra bit of money I had and paying off debt and that kind of stuff. And when I got laid off, I started my company with 500 bucks because that's what I had. So when I started, when we started looking as we went, as we've grown, we've grown organically, we've bootstrapped. But one of the things that I'm realizing is either I need a war chest to patent everything and lock people out and crazy security and all that kind of stuff, or I need to go exactly in the opposite spirit, which is the way I really prefer anyway. I mean, the open source community, you know what? Go for it. We're gonna put it out there, we're gonna develop it as a community. Let's see how fast Linksys can move, you know? Um, I think really that's the only way for a small business to protect itself is to be completely open and transparent in their development. Um, on that mod layer, anything in an Ubuntu server can be set up to do, you could create a mod for. It has built-in user protection unless you override it. What you don't want is people bricking their bricking it. But what you also want is, has anyone here ever bricked something in DDWRT and you weren't able to bring it back to life? What you want in this thing, worst case scenario, you pop a new drive in there, right? Or you wipe the drive and you put it in. It's no longer a static firmware, a hard-coded firmware that's in there. And boy, if you screw it up, how in the heck are you gonna get in? It's literally a hard drive you could re remove. Pop on another machine, wipe it, re-flash it with the image, you're good to go. Configuration insurance development community, our marketplace. Steve Jobs said this about innovation. It's really funny when David right back there in the light blue shirt, I'll point out, um, I have Davidisms that I record at work. And he said, one of the things that David said one of the first months, we were arguing about whether we should go down the patent road and do something closed or whether we should go open. And he said, you know, in technology, you make money by innovating, by innovating faster than the other guy. And you know, that's really what we're trying to do here is, you know, let's speed the course of development. Let's keep it open. So it's not really about the money, it's about the people, how we're led, how we use it. So the potential market, one of the things that's really funny and interesting to me, I love seeing kind of global, global, um, I love to see how large markets kind of shift and what happens. Back in, 2010 in January, the same month I started my company, Nexus One was launched. Anyone remember about how much that cost when it came out? It was around $800. And when you look back today, three years later, the Nexus One, oh my goodness, it was, they should have had more power, they should have had a bigger screen, they should have done this and that. But the initial market for the Nexus One, for these Android phones that, that was unlocked, that you could actually do development on, was developers. The initial market for this may not be mar mass market yet. The initial market may be developers who want their hands on a great piece of routing equipment that they can actually modify in a fluid fashion. But then the next group that kind of comes in is the prosumer. It's the people who say, you know what, yeah, I can spend $150 on a router that kind of barely gets me by, or I can spend $800 on a router that kicks ass, and I'm proud to have it in my, in my house. And that's the prosumers, it's the guys who don't mind spending 
$1,200, $1,500 for a laptop or more. Whereas I'm the value play guy, I tend to go for the, for the lower end on the equipment. Then you've got small businesses in Soho. How many small businesses would love to have a router that also did some server functions and did their phone server for a 20 person office? Very functional. When you start adding those pieces, it's a lot more than $1,000. And when you look at technically the support of that, it's, um, it's a compelling value proposition for a small business. But just like the, the smartphone, remember when the smartphone came out and people were like, well, why the heck would I want one? I don't want to, you know, the, the everyman, a lot of people were still like, well, why would I want that? But now everyone wants that. We expect that same kind of transition can happen in the router market. We have 10,000 routers around the world. We're just a small little company on Main Street in Simpsonville, South Carolina. But we've got 10,000 customized routers worldwide that we've put out and we've supported through the past three years. We've got experience in the router side. We see where things are going. We're connecting with South Koreans who have 200 megabyte pipes. We're connecting with Singaporeans who have fiber optics into their condos. And we're connecting with people in China who still can't get Facebook unless they use our router to bypass the Great Firewall. So we see kind of the needs and the hurts and all that as we look around the globe. It is what we do and we love to do. Um, we're all about networking. We're all about Linux. I will tell you, I had never run Linux I and mean, gotten down to the core of it until three years ago. But my goodness, what an amazing, powerful OS. Lives change. The first year Sabai Technology was in business, and we had created our first uh, VPN router, and one of the customers had picked it up. Christmas morning in 2010, I walked downstairs and I checked my email as the kids had finished opening in the presents, and one of the U.S. ambassadors to Russia wrote an email and said, you just don't realize what a difference this product has made in my life. I've been able, you know, he said before, every few months I was having to replace my debit cards and stuff because the numbers kept getting pulled from the IP traffic. You know, my family couldn't securely email. Those kinds of things. We've got, you know, missionaries in China that use our VPN router. It's really funny, we get so psyched about the technology, but the reality is it is about people. And it's about enabling people to be free, to live their lives without obstruction. That's what I think this is, this is really about. It's about community. It's about a group of people getting together and deciding they want to change things. And some of our best friends have been customers who have bought our products and we've gotten to know over the years. And who every time we come out with something new, they're in there and they're helping give us feedback and they're getting the betas and stuff like that. Something I kind of wanted to end with here is some of the potential. When you've got that much capability that is untapped at the core of your network, what are some of the cool things we could do with it? One of them I love is, is community filtering. I believe that, as I mentioned before, I should have a right to decide what comes into my house. Well, my phone system at my house is a system called UMA, and some of you guys in this room may have an UMA. One of the things I love about UMA is I can look back at past phone calls that have come into my house, and I can say, oh, that was someone trying to sell a credit card. That was, and I can classify calls that were not friends and family. That gets added to a community list 
when there's enough from a certain phone number, it goes on to a community blacklist, and I can choose on UMA that I don't want to hear from credit card salespeople, that I don't want to hear from nonprofits trying to raise money. I don't want to hear from these kind of things. What if you could do the same thing with your IP traffic? You could take a look at the places. You know, have you ever taken a look at your logs at all the places you're getting traffic from and so many of them weren't ones that you actually went to their site? You know, how cool would it be if you could classify those and we could create a community blacklist? If you got a million people all doing that, now you got some serious power and you can opt in or you can opt out or you could choose what you wanted blocked. Automated VPN. Let's say you've got a gyro unit at home and you have, you got a three month job in Raleigh, North Carolina and you get a temporary apartment. You set up a second gyro and it says, um, you've already got one of these set up. Would you like to connect the networks and unify them as one network? If you choose yes, the routers can connect to Sabai technology. We can facilitate the handshakes and the passing of credentials, etc., and then back right out. And you have one network, and all everything you had at home is now right with you in Raleigh. Starling Web is what I'm calling this one. It's something David and I were just kind of visioning the other day. But I don't know if you've seen these. Before, have you ever seen birds doing this? Well, how cool would it be if the traffic that left your home could not be trackable as a single stream, even encrypted or not, but could break out and bounce off other Sabai routers where people had enabled that functionality, and then swarm back when the information is coming back to you. I don't know about you, and I love this country more than, more than anything, but I tell you what, there's some freedoms and some privacy issues going on today that are really scary. And you know, I should have some control over my life and over my home, what comes in and what goes out and who sees it. I believe. If this sounds like something that you, you know what, I like where this is going, I want to be engaged, I would ask, and many of you have already done this, but click the QR code, go to self.sabitechnology.com and sign up there. I'm not going to send you a bunch of sales stuff, but I am going to keep you informed about the project as we move forward, as we have our first, first viable version of the software that you can install, development opportunities, things like that. Or at the booth you can sign up. And what we'll be giving you access to is the ability to get updates, downloads, alpha, beta, etc. Oh, uh, let me tell you though about alpha, beta release conceptually what we're trying to do here. Right now David's working very hard on the foundational structure, okay, on which this is being developed and on which mods can be uh, developed. As we get that, Ray, um, we're going to get to a point where your base functionality of a router, all the networking, port forwarding, wireless, that kind of stuff, that's good and it's ready to go and it's in a module and we have a working unit, which we have a, a very basic functional unit right out there right now. But 
once it's at the point where it would compare with, at least with the MIPS unit, that's what we're calling alpha. That means you're, you're running the car without all the sheet metal and without all the protections built in yet, all that kind of stuff. If you're interested in being on that alpha team, we're interested in having you as part of it. Beta is, you know what, you're a power user, you love being on the cutting edge, you love trying out the newest stuff before everyone else gets in, that kind of stuff. Beta means that there's going to already be some modules developed that you could install, things like that, module development's going on. And then the third would be a full release. Third would be full release. I actually worked for Tony Robbins out in, out in California for a year. He's an interesting guy, very, very smart. One of the things he says is the quality of your life is in direct proportion to the amount of uncertainty you're willing to live with. And that's one of the things about supply technology. <laughs> ask David, you can ask any of the employees out there. We've, we are okay with pushing the edge. We're okay with, well, there isn't a clear market for this yet. Are you sure you want to do this? I mean, we're willing to go ahead because I believe strongly this is where routing is, is going to go. And we've been blessed with an amazing staff. Um, we're up to 10 folks now, but they are dedicated, smart, and a coherent team. And I'm just very, honored to, uh, to lead them. And that's pretty much in a nutshell, Gyro. And, and what I'd like to do is just open up the floor to questions, ideas, uh, statements. Uh-huh. All right, you mentioned doing a free BBX on there. Do you have any uh, thoughts of adding like, hardware bundlings to it, FXOs, FXS? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's a great question. So his question was, you, when you're talking about free PBX, have you thought about actually having the physical phone lines and stuff on there? Um, no for now, because partly that can be done with ATAs and things like that through the ethernet. And what I want is the, what I want is the simplest and most powerful for the most people out of the gate. Though I will say, one of the things that we've considered is, wouldn't it be great if we got to a volume with a hardware manufacturer where we could have a sliding port where you could plug in, for example, a cable modem with the cable hook or a fiber optic, you know, or some phone jacks or, you know, and really what's going to, what that's going to take is scale. That's a great question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. One of the things that we actually do want to do is I know there's been this huge move to no antennas or the antennas are actually built within the plastic of the device. We do want to have the ability for people to use specialized antennas and stuff like that on it. Um, the answer to your question is really as Sabai technology, we're going to need to be focused on a core amount of equipment that we know will run with it. But because it's on the Ubuntu server, you absolutely. And one of the things that, you know, particularly I know that you work with nonprofits and stuff like that, one of the things that we're dedicated to here is you can develop, you know, you can set up your own hardware and we can give you a list of known wireless cards and chipsets and that kind of stuff that, that our development has set it up. But could you write a module to install new drivers for a different card? That would be a possibility. And so it is possible also to create a module that you may just use privately or with a few, with one organization. And you might not ever put up on the mod store because it's so unique 
and tweaked for your situation that you may not uh, ever make a mass market thing? That's a great question. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, David. And David, if you come up so you can use the mic. Okay. And, and let me let you talk to the technical side of the house, um, which is more what. Well, let me here. try without the microphone first. No, because they Does the recording. The yeah. Ah. Sorry always being recorded. Okay, so anyways, um, if any of you would like to answer questions without participating in group interrogation, you can come by our table afterwards, right over there on the corner. Uh, anyways, developing a mod, all the mod is, for the most part, is really just a web app, essentially. It's a bunch of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and there's a server-side component. Uh, currently, all of those are written in PHP, but you can use any server-side language you like. That's essentially the long and short of it. Uh, the limitations that we're putting on the mods, there aren't any, <laughs> really, apart from the fact that you basically have to have some kind of web UI in order for it to actually be a mod. Um, the other kind of half of that is we're looking at having a whole other class of them that are essentially uh, sort of like virtual machines. For those of you who are familiar with Linux containers, it's going to be, say you want free PBX or uh, free NAS, It'll run in a Linux container as a VM, separate from the server, separate from the rest of the machine. That'll be a, a mod of a sort, but it'll be, you know, a fairly hefty one compared to, say, a mod that tracks your stocks and sends you alerts about stocks or something like that. So, any uh, sort of unclarity with that, we actually have a little paper that details all the design goals for the mods. Uh, also, the bulk of the code that we're putting into the front end for the UI is actually dedicated to making it easy for you to write out essentially a template for what you want to control and how you want to represent it in the UI. And then kind of the toolkit takes care of drawing all the UI bits, all the controls, validating all the input, and sending it back. So developers don't have to bother with a whole lot of programming. They don't have to write an entire essentially website in order to write a mod. So anyone's dealt with, uh, I don't want to say Drupal because I know the learning curve on Drupal is considered suicidal, but if you've dealt with simple content management systems, that's the kind of thing we're going for in terms of templating. So what else? Moss questions. Yes. Um, you would probably have to use some kind of API for that, because either it would have to already exist. For instance, I imagine Asterisk has a number of things in it that I'm not even remotely aware of that do these kinds of things. Or you would have to kind of come up with an interface for it. Because you know, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with kind of the basic server client model with you know, web stuff. But you know, what runs in the browser has to have some way of talking to what runs on the server. As long as that's there, you can do whatever you want with it. So, at least that's the idea. You guys got a, a theoretical limit for how many apps uh, it either all VM uh, sandbox apps, basically? Uh, probably Tim would be a better person to ask about that because he actually has been running um, Proxmox, which mostly uses virtualization. So they're a little bit heavier than the Linux containers, but they're they're very close to it because of the way Proxmox works. Um, he has a machine at home, I think he runs about eight or nine different machines on it concurrently, and he has them running all the time. Um, I, the closest thing I've gotten to this is I've kind of tested out how easy it is to install from an install CD in a Linux container, and I've only done one thing with it because I've been very busy with the UI, so my, I haven't put a lot of time into that yet. Um, I can tell you this, the way that Linux containers work you know, with normal VMs, typically you're running a kernel for every single machine on top of your kernel. 
Linux, kernel, uh, Linux containers work by sharing the kernel that you already have. So there's a lot of overhead that you avoid that way. Uh, and you pretty much only have the actual memory requirements and processor requirements of the programs that are running in those containers. So. But I think to, you know, of course now I don't have the mic on. But <laughs> let me stand by David. Yeah, I, I didn't realize you had a mic on. I thought you were just that yeah. loud. I, I, I do think that the bulk of the modules would be running on the the processes for those would be running on the Ubuntu server yeah. underlying layer. It would be it would be a specialized so program like uh, FreeNAS or something in BSD that you may want to run that would not be supported on the underlying Ubuntu that you may want to do in a virtualized instance. Yeah, a, a good example I heard of earlier, and this is one of the reasons behind this idea. Um, free PBX does not play well with other software on a server. So if you want to run multiple, say, Apache servers with your free PBX install, there's a lot of configuration that goes into that just to keep it from breaking other things. And what we want to build into the gyro is if you turn something on, if it's going to break something, it tells you, at least. It doesn't just break it. Or at least you know what the requirements are before you turn it on. Um, the Linux containers allow us to kind of bypass the problem of trying to translate something like FreePBX into a self-contained web app kind of thing. We can just run it as a Linux container and let the FreePBX people deal with you know, their actual development. We don't have to interfere with it or introduce a whole other branch or fork of it. You know, we get to essentially not meddle in their world. Right. That's great. How do you mean? I mean, the, the, for instance, the thing we have out there running now has an end card in it. Um, AC? Or? Ah, I've not even heard of this, honestly. Um, well, hardware-wise, the idea is pretty much we're trying to give you the ability to essentially put anything in it you would like as far as things you might buy individually. Um, also, I would like to see us be able to offer a range of options for the hardware as far as individual pieces and modules that we put into it. Um, but as far as just supporting it generally, because we're building on Linux, it's pretty much whatever is available as drivers currently, which is a pretty broad range of things I know, so I, I may sound rather vague saying that. Um, if it's supported in the network stack normally, it'll be supported on our product. It's actually in the kernel. Oh, well then there you go. Yeah. So yeah, because we're, we're, we're trying to muddy the waters as little as possible to keep everything familiar. That's why Ubuntu server, PHP, you know, the web app stuff, these are all things that everyone uses pretty much all the time everywhere. They're things you're familiar with. We're not introducing like our new special thing that you have to learn. You know, we're trying to keep it simple. One well, of my big beliefs when I'm looking at things, too, is that there's a huge power in aggregation. And to me, and, and there's a huge lack of power in lack of aggregation. So if you have a router and you have a NAS and you have a home automation system and you have a server for your IP cameras and you have, th there's some real challenges there. But if you can unify, a big part of this is being able to aggregate services in the same way, again, like your smartphone aggregates a lot of different functionality in one little handheld device. Or tricorder, as some people have taken. That's right. Them. That's right. Any other questions for the group? If not, I want to thank you guys so much, and we'll be here afterwards and also over at, over at the table. But I thank you guys so much for your time. I don't know where this is put on. There we go. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing.
Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication from Wicked. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. 
Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the Cloud Stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, 
We've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digim, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Astros cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Astros convoit communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.